Good evening. Welcome to Insights. Tonight's Insights show is a production uh, of tape I took at the National Convention, Veterans for Peace National Annual Convention in Dallas, Texas. It'll be featuring a speech or a comments from our national president, David Klein, for about 10 minutes. And, after, and then also, you'll have 40 minutes of uh, the guest speaker at the banquet Saturday night, Jim Hightower. It's quite funny. If you're a Bush fan, maybe you want to change this channel because it's a lot of Bush bashing and you'll get a kick out of it. And it's a little humorous for this time of year, I think you might need. At the convention and with me, was at the convention and with me tonight is Dr. Paul St. Amon. Welcome to Insights, Paul. Thank you, Jesse. I'm happy to be here. Paul, I want to ask you right off the bat here. You know, you're a, Paul is a uh, professor at State University of New York. And he's, the, he's been a longtime member of the Samantha Smith chapter up in Ipswich in the Gloucester area. He's now founder and the president of a new chapter uh, in North Country Potsdam, Veterans for Peace in Potsdam, New York, up by the University of New York. Now, Paul, I know you're going back to uh, the college to start teaching again in a week or so, but I wanted to ask you something. Returning to your, that academic world, I assume that your students will be researching data and comparing positions with final scientific analyzation of this present Bush administration. Now, with this, with this information, I'm sure they'll come up with a conclusion, this administration is nuts. <laughs> I stole well, that from Hightower, I, I see on the tape. I'm not so, so sure my students will be doing that, Jesse. Oh. Uh, I teach in the English department, mm -hmm. uh, so this isn't political science. That is not what we'll probably be doing. But I can tell you that in my writing courses and in my argument, uh, in the teaching of argument, we do bring up contentious issues, and they do have an opportunity to research them. Well, if they bring the draft back and there's no deferments for the students, I'm sure it'll be a very popular subject. On I'm the sure if they bring the draft back, you're absolutely right. But right now, unfortunately, students are not thinking about the draft per se because they're living their lives this summer and uh, probably have just now gotten to the anxiety that I've gotten about going back and teaching. Well, it's like a lot of people have said to me in a sense, as long as there's poor people dying in Iraq, yeah. nobody's going to really care too much. And that's a sad state of affairs. But Paul, I want to get back to the, to the productions that we're going to comment that will be coming up very <laughs> shortly. What, do you, what was the highlight you think about, you know, uh, David as our national president, David Klein. And David, you know, is, he's been, he's got three purple hearts and, you know, he's been the, the, the all down the road and, and he really brings the organization together. David is a wonderful spokesperson for our organization, I think. Uh, he's got all of the credentials one might need as a combat vet to talk about the issues of war and the need for change in this country. Uh, it, it seems to me that one of the big issues that we faced going to Texas was the whole notion of going to Texas. We all sort of wondered, why are we going to Texas to have our national convention? Uh, it turned out to be a, a very good thing to do, uh, as we'll talk about later, uh, as we did go down and support Cindy Sheehan when she went down uh, to Crawford. Uh, the other, the other, well, let me give you an example. Jim Hightower, whom we'll see, does not say this, but uh, he says, Texas politics, he says, well, you know, nothing is in the middle of the road in Texas except yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> I remember that. And I think you get a sense of Jim Hightower's uh, uh, ability as a, as a wit um, it, just through that particular statement that he makes. Uh, but uh, Dave is, Dave talks a lot about <clears throat> the kinds of uh, work that Veterans for Peace has been doing for some time. And uh, the fact that we were all down there together work with, in workshops and uh, working together for peace, trying to think about programs that we might implement back at our various chapters, was probably the most important part of that convention for us. It was really about us coming together. Uh, there were over 200 of us there. And uh, that, was, that was, in a sense, the important okay, aspect of it. We that. only got a couple of minutes left here. We also, the, the thing with Jim Hightower, I mean, he had yeah. us a lot of laughing in the aisles, and uh, he really kind of lightened it up because I, one of the things that was a bad experience for me because I had to deal with a lot of people in my life who had post traumatic stress from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And dealing with some of these young guys back from Iraq that uh, 
recognize in their post-traumatic stress was very obvious to me. It was like a flashback, like I'm looking at that same 22-year-old face. So bring in a little Hightower's humor and what have you. And at this time of the year, how sad, like on that weekend, 20 Marines were killed. I think it was on page 20. Something. Absolutely. And, and those sort of things. So did Hightower, how did that affect you and the group, uh, do you think? I mean, I guess you could say that Hightower provided some levity for us. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I, I heard all of the Iraqi vets, uh, those in particular who were dealing with P PTSD, uh, talk about their experiences. And it was so powerful and poignant that uh, I mean, certainly Hightower didn't gloss it over at all. Uh, but his speech really doesn't address that. What his speech really addresses is, is the, uh, the notion of community and unity and trying to act now because somebody is stealing our country. Somebody's stealing our country? That's thievery. So it seems. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, he makes that point. Okay, Paul, you'll be coming back because we're going to be, I'm going to have you in for the studio for another shot on the Cindy uh, Shannon story that we were very much involved with VFP. She came to our convention. We yes. went down there with her. I got great footage great footage on this production that you'll see and a lot of people asking for it. So stay tuned for the show coming up and uh, with, with the high tower and the comedy and come back and watch the next one. So thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Insights and good night. Okay, this is an interview with Dave Klein, the president of Veterans for Peace. I'd be interested in knowing what your expectations were when we came here and what your feelings about uh, it are now, now that we're just about to wrap it up. Well, uh, my expectations in coming here was that we'd have a number of our members from around the country coming together, making plans for how we're going to continue promoting our cause, our putting out our message, assisting our, our brothers and sisters coming back from Iraq. and. You know, coming to Texas, which is not one of the stronger areas for our organization, we weren't sure how we would do because we thought it was important to come here because we want to reach out to the areas. It's not like we just go to areas where we got a lot of members. We're trying to reach out and uh, reach reach new veterans, you know, more veterans. But coming down here was way beyond what I expected. First off, this convention, we've had over 200 members from around the country and uh, from a number of the chapters. We have 127 chapters in the group. And people coming together, we've had workshops, we had plenary sessions, we had a general meeting, passing resolutions. We've did a number of things. And there was a strong sense of unity and common purpose. And we had our differences and discussions, but it was all based on we're working for the same thing to try and stop the war in Iraq, bring our troops home, and get our country to change its direction. Also, today we sent uh, one of the mothers whose son was killed in Iraq, Cindy Sheehan, went down to Crawford, Texas, to President Bush's ranch, and along with them we sent a, a, a platoon of our group. Uh, Forty members went down, it was actually two platoons, and to participate with her in this action because she was going down there to demand to meet with Bush and it turns out that her action down there has caused national media coverage of both her, her individual action, our support for her, and our convention. So this has turned into something much bigger than I had anticipated it would be. As a reporter of about 40 years experience and as a member of Veterans for Peace and a veteran myself, uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned her uh, and you mentioned the Iraq war veterans. Uh, I think that in some ways, uh, see if you agree with this, Dave, in some ways uh, those two elements, that is her and the Iraq war veterans, in terms of public perception and public acceptance and, and joining your, your mo our movement here, have been the strongest things, don't you think? Yeah, well, I think that those who are impacted by the war directly, both those who fought in it and those whose loved ones are fighting in it, have the most credible voices in objecting to what the president's led us into and also have the most reason to object because their kids or their husbands or wives or they and their buddies either were go are over there or were over there and if you were over there you had friends that died so you have a commitment sealed in blood to fight for what's right and once you realize that what the president and this administration is 
telling us and doing in Iraq and that they're all based on lies, it comes a point where you have to stand up if you care about this country and if you really are a patriot. How do you get that message out to the public? Well, we do it through a lot of ways. We do it through one-on-one -on -one discussions. We, around the country, Veterans for Peace has been organizing memorials along the lines of Arlington West to bring out the number of dead Americans and Iraqis. You know, the, 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 the administration has been trying to hide those numbers or downplay those facts, hoping that most people won't care. We do it through talking to young people in the schools about the truth about mili military service and the recruiters. We do it through leafleting and demonstrations. We'll be participating in the big United for Peace and Justice march and activities in, in Washington from September 24th to 26th. And we do it through holding events like this and promoting it to the media and letting the people know what we're doing. You think the tide is turning? Well, you know, I think that I think that that uh, right now we're at a place where if we keep moving ahead, the tide is turning. But what we need to do is put enough pressure on those who are elected to represent us in Congress so enough people have the backbone to stand up to this administration and to stop this madness. You know, there's a lot of people in, who voted for this war. Now they all have second do uh, doubt. They have their second thoughts, they claim. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people caved in and just went along with what were pretty clearly bogus even at that time. So what we need to do is get more people in Congress to say this war is going to stop. You know how the war is going to stop? When they stop funding it. It would seem to me that the, that the really the, the most uh, effective spokespeople and, and activists against war would be people who have been there. Yeah, well, I mean, the reality... It's pretty is, obvious. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, and it's also something that drives us, because having been to war, I'm a disabled Vietnam combat veteran. I have three purple hearts. I've been shot twice and hit with shrapnel once. Um, you know, like having been to war, you know what the reality of war is. America has largely been spared war on its soil since uh, the Civil War or Wounded Knee in 1890s. And, you know, so to most Americans, war is there's someone going away they know or a movie. And a lot of times soldiers come back and don't want to talk to the rest of the people about war, so people don't really get it. But we have a responsibility as, as, as veterans. I'm a Vietnam vet. I'm not going to turn my back on these young Iraqi veterans, because I know this is like, to me, almost like a deja vu thing about Vietnam, you know? They're something, aren't they? Well, you know, that's, you know, I mean, look, you got people in the White House who, they're my age or even older, they managed to find ways to get out of going to Vietnam. They could have been right next to me, you know. They made sure when it came their time to go be sent to war that they didn't go. Yet now they're in power and they're going to send our children to war. It's, they're not something else. They are a bunch of chicken hawks. And as far as I'm concerned, they're a bunch of traitors. These uh, young Iraq veterans, I have, I have been impressed with them beyond words. Yeah, well, you know. That was us a long time ago, you know, like sometimes I work with these guys. I actually sort of play a, a advisory role to the Iraq veterans against the war. In fact, I helped them in terms of using our experience as a member of Vietnam veterans against the war back in the 70s you know, to uh, help them figure out how to deal with things. And when I see them, I see myself uh, 35 years ago, you know. Okay, well, thanks, Dave. Uh, keep up the work, and uh, I will do the same, and we'll all do the same. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. That's an interview with Dave Klein, the president of Veterans for Peace, and as you heard, a Vietnam War veteran. This is Joe Day reporting. Yes. He's been for three decades battling the powers that be on behalf of the powers that ought to be. That's just us plain folks here. He was elected for two terms as the Texas Agricultural Commissioner, and being a 26-year Texan, I am proud to say I voted for him. He did some wonderful stuff here in this mostly benighted state, including introducing the organic program. And it's a darn shame he's gone, because they've done some damage since. But anyway, he did some great stuff. 
He's funny, he's moving, he's intense. As Molly Ivan said, and we hope to have her here too, but she was otherwise occupied, she says if Will Rogers and Mother Jones had a baby, Jim Hightower would be that rambunctious child, mad as hell and with a sense of humor. Let's bring on Jim Hightower. <laughs>
want to thank you equally sincerely for your continuing courageous service in the cause of peace, which is the ultimate cause, I think, of our society. You and your expanding, forceful, eloquent, important organization represents the very best of America. And I'm here chiefly to applaud you and to urge you to keep on keeping on. It is your activism, your willingness to challenge the status quo, to confront authority. That is the on issues of peace. Sometimes you might get to feeling like that guy that B.B. King sings about. Remember that verse, nobody likes you but your mama, and she might be jiving you too. <laughs> Did you ever get to feeling like that? Yeah. It's never easy, but it is essential what you are doing. If our country is ever to live up to its ideals and its potential, I referred to you at the top here as agitators. Powers that be try to make that a pejorative in our society. All those agitators. Our workers were perfectly happy in the factory until those union agitators came in and started messing with them. Those poor people didn't mind living up against that toxic waste dump until those environmental agitators came in and started messing with their minds. Well, hogwash and horse hockey. <laughs> Agitation is what America's all about. If it were not for agitators, we'd be all wearing white powdered wigs singing God Hail the Queen here tonight. <laughs> Agitators built America. Agitation is what we represent. There were the founders, of course, the pamphleteers, the Sons of Liberty. But that was only the beginning. They didn't provide democracy. They provided documents that allowed the possibility of democracy. In that first presidential election that chose George Washington, do you know only 4% of the American people were eligible to vote. You could not vote if you were a woman. You were chattel. You could not vote if you were Native American. You were a heathen. You couldn't vote if you were African American. You were a slave. You could not vote if you did not own land because you were riffraff. Only 4% could vote in the first presidential election. We don't celebrate on the 4th of July the documents of democracy. Rather, we celebrate those who came afterwards to democratize those documents. I'm talking about Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, abolitionists and the suffragists. I'm talking about Thoreau and Emerson, Walt Whitman and Mark Twain, populists and the Wobblies, Mother Jones and Woody Guthrie, Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez. And now it's down to you and me. It's our time to be the agitators again. And when they say to you, well, you're just an agitator, you say right back at him, yeah, that's the center post in the washing machine that gets the dirt out. <laughs> we need a lot more agitation. Agitate. Agitate. Need that agitating spirit more than ever before. No longer enough for us to be progressive. We've been passively progressive for a long time. It's time for us to become aggressive again. Because the powers of be have become radically regressive. Running roughshod over working folks. Roughshod over family farmers. Roughshod over old folks and children. Roughshod over the middle class now. Not just poor folks, but now the middle class. Roughshod over our air and our water and our food. They get to thinking that they're the top dogs and we're just a bunch of fire hydrants out here. It's pretty much the attitude that I see. They're stealing our country from us. And when I say they, let me be specific. I'm talking about the downsizers and the globalizers, the militarizers and the imperializers, the Enroners and Exxoners, the Dow chemicalizers and Halliburton insiders, the big shots and the bastards, the Bushites and the bullshitters. That's who I'm talking about. They're stealing our country. George the W. And his autocratic 
plutocratic, theocratic regime of kleptocrats. I mean, think about it. In four short years, these people have looted our public treasury of hundreds of billions of dollars for nothing more noble than to give it away to their wealthiest campaign contributors. They have defoliated our environmental and safety protections. They have shredded our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, sought to castrate labor unions, privatize everything from the post office to now the military. And now they have us launched on a maniacal, messianic, testosterone-driven global war to make the world safe for Halliburton. You know, they, they say that in sex, using a feather is erotic. But using the whole chicken, that's kinky. <laughs> These people are using the whole chicken. Now, in bipartisan fairness, I've got to say that too much of this has been abetted by milk toast corporate Democrats in Congress, by my party. And we've got to take my party back. Some people say we need a third party. I want a second party. <laughs> and I want it to be mine. But it is the Bushites who have been so intently, audaciously, voraciously, gleefully pushing America down a deep, dark, dangerous hole of right-wing ideological extremism. Now, I've been watching these folks for a long time. Watching them here in Texas, five years, Bush as governor. Watching them, of course, up in Washington, D.C., now in Iraq, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Iran, and beyond, globally. And watching them from an academic perspective. I have come to this dispassionate, unbiased, and scientific conclusion. These people are nuts. Just absolutely bulgous, loopy zealots committed to a reactionary, Enronian, John Ashcroftian, Jerry Falwellian, Dr. Strange Lovian remake of our country. Our friend Bill Moyers, raised by the way over here in Marshall, Texas, said the delusional is no longer marginal. It has come in from the fringe to sit in the seat of power. Now let me say this to you. To back up from the details and get a little bit of the bigger picture, what's at work in the cabal of ignorance and arrogance that's been formed between Washington and Wall Street is the abandonment of America's historic uniting epic of the common good. The idea that we're all in this together. That's what holds this big, brawling, sprawling, disparate nation together. The idea that we're all in this together. I've got a section uh, in, in a book uh, that I wrote. This section is called Daddy's Philosophy. Now, you got to beware of Texans telling daddy stories. But I had a pretty good one right up the road north of us here in Denison, Texas, where I was raised. And my old daddy got a few Denisonians here tonight, Grayson County Heights. And my old daddy did not know that he had a political philosophy. He would have been embarrassed to have been told that he had one. <laughs> he was just a working guy. He grew up in the Depression on a tenant farm. He got off of that farm and with my mother helped to establish a small business up in Dennis that made a lower middle class life for myself and my brothers and allowed us to have, have some possibilities. And my daddy believed in that ethic of the common good. And he would express his political philosophy to me periodically in these terms. He'd say, Jim, everybody does better when everybody does better. <laughs> That's what passes for political philosophy in Denison, Texas. It's not bad, is it? Now that is 
what they're attempting to destroy. The notion that everybody does better when everybody does better. Instead of everybody, they're saying, we can take care of the good fortunes of the few and not worry about the well-being of the many. I've got a section in another book I wrote. Right over there, we're going to have a little book sign in here in a minute. A little louder, Chris! Yeah. I've got a section in this book called Never Have So Few Done So Much for So Few. <laughs> it's really pretty astonishing when you look at it because what they're doing is implementing a new pernicious ethic of greed that says, I got mine, you get yours. Never give a sucker an even break. Caveat emptor, I'm rich and you're not. Adios chump. Pretty much what you're saying to us. You want greed? Well, 150,000 of our soldiers have their lives on the line every day in Iraq and Afghanistan. Many of them still, still, without the protective armor that they need, literally having to scavenge for metal plates and load their vehicles with sandbags in a futile effort to keep from being ripped apart in roadside bombs. Congress, this last week, okayed the Bush-Cheney energy bill doling out $14.5 billion in subsidies and tax giveaways to the oil, gas, and nuclear giants. These are corporations so rich that they could afford to air condition hell. <laughs> and I tell you what, they better be setting some money aside for that project. <laughs> Included in that energy bill was a $1.5 billion special fund that'll be run, turned over, and run by a private consortium controlled by such Texas corporations as Halliburton. $1.5 billion doled out to them. This is why Lily Tomlin has said that no matter how cynical you get, it's almost impossible to keep up. <laughs> You want greed? In my next issue, the Hightower Lowdown, and I think we're passing out some copies of that to you good folks here, I'll talk about an issue about this war. George W. went on television, I'm sure you heard about it, just before July 4th to say that his Iraq adventure is absolutely crucial to America's national security. He called on young people to sign up volunteer for his glorious war, declaring that it is worth the sacrifices we are making. <laughs> we? <laughs> Note that Jenna and Barbara, the Bush twins, who are of prime enlistment age, are making no sacrifice. In In the cause in Iraq, is so worthy, is so essential to our national security. Why haven't George's daughters joined Daddy's War? Instead of wearing desert camouflage in Baghdad or Basra, Jenna and Barb are wearing designer dresses to all of the hip bars on the D.C. social circuit. And note, too, that the war does not seem to be, to be worth any personal sacrifice from Dick Cheney's family. While he continues to profit from Halliburton, which has sucked up some $15 billion in Pentagon contracts tied to Iraq, not a single member of Cheney's family signed up for duty there. Curious, isn't it? In fact, of 535 members of Congress, most of whom are war-hooping boosters of Bush's Iraq occupation, only two have any kids or grandkids or other close family members in the fight. Halliburton executives, corporate lobbyists in Washington, media barons, the Fox News blowhards. Where are their loved ones? Nowhere near the front. Iraq, to borrow a phrase from Steve Earle's great new song, is the rich man's war, but the rich man has made damn sure that it's not his fight. By the way, this is uh, nothing new. You can go back to the Civil War when 
young men soon to become infamously rich robber barons were able to avoid putting their butts on the line in the Civil War by paying $300 apiece for substitutes to go fight for them. J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Philip Armour, Jay Gould, and James Mellon were among those who bought their way out. As Mellon's father explained to him in a letter, a man may be a patriot without risking his own life or sacrificing his health. There are plenty of lives less valuable. This is now official policy in the Iraq-Afghanistan war. Some say we need a national draft to even out this discrepancy. I think all we need is one new rule, a selective draft. All politicians who support a shooting war will have their loved ones drafted to be the first ones put in the line of fire. That's it. You want greed? When the troops come home, even those who come back whole, where are the jobs? Last year, George W. presidential campaign was darting around like a sand flea on steroids, <laughs> saying, look, there's a booming economy. My tax cuts for the rich are working. I've created 600,000 new jobs. But wait a minute. We lost 3 million jobs in Bush's first term. But most importantly, the issue is not jobs. Slaves had jobs. The issue is pay, income, wages, middle class possibilities. You can go down the road here to a cafe or a bar and talk to a waitress and say, George W. created 600,000 new jobs. She'd say, yeah, I know, I have three of them. <laughs> Wages, in terms of buying power, on average, wages today are beneath what they were when Richard Nixon was president. The average wage of the jobs that George has created, $9,000 less than the jobs that he lost. That's the difference between a middle-class economy and a poverty economy. These aren't jobs, they're Walmart jobettes. You want greed? Look at that wage level, the minimum wage. This is the wage floor that we establish, that we say this is an ethical position, this is an issue of morality. We say we will not allow wages to go below this minimum wage level, which is $5.15 an hour. Has been that, stuck at that for the last seven years. That's $10,500 a year gross in birth, both terms of that. Word. Who can make it on 10-5 anywhere in America today? That's for full-time work. Been stuck there since 1998. But our Congress critters, I've got to say in fairness, have given a big raise to one group of important workers themselves. Every year for the last seven years, they have given themselves a pay increase. And in fact, just uh, last month, for the seventh time in seven years, they raised their own pay again to a total of $165,000 a year. Now, luckily, we have Tom DeLay to explain this to us. <laughs> Tom DeLay, after this latest pay raise, said, it is not a pay raise. Thank you. It is not a pay raise. It is an adjustment. It's just so the members of Congress are not losing their purchasing power. And then he said, I challenge anyone to live on my salary. <laughs> you look at a guy like DeLay and you think, a hundred thousand sperm and you were the fastest? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> you 
want grade? The Bushites have even grabbed our Bibles from us, using the Bible as a shield for their kleptocracy. Waving the Bible, they say that they're all about family values. Oh, like Rush Limbaugh, the drug-addicted blowhard who's now racked up divorce number three. Is that the family they're talking about? Well, let's talk about America's real family values. Values that are inclusive, welcoming, uniting. The true values of America. What are those? Well, there's at least three of them. Economic fairness. We believe that in our gut. Every American does. Social justice. That's in our hearts. It's rarely appealed to, but it's there. Equal opportunity for all people. Those are the values. Those are the founding values of America. Indeed, these values of fairness, justice, opportunity, these are the values and the vision of the founders. Benjamin Franklin spoke about it at the founding. He said that the destiny of America is not power. The destiny of America is light. Whoa. He was talking about that beacon of fairness, justice, opportunity for all. Now, sadly, we've got too few of our leaders, Washington, Wall Street, the media, anywhere else, even talking about these values anymore, much less seeking to implement any of them. Of course, I think our problem is we've got too many 5-watt bulbs sitting in 100-watt sockets. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, there is a technical term for what Washington and Wall Street are doing to us. This technical term is stealing. <laughs> Faster than a hog eats supper. But their thievery is bigger than we realize. And this is my main message to you as I come to near the end of this preparation here. It's bigger than the offshore middle class possibilities. It's bigger than the, than the environmental destruction. It is bigger than the war of lies. They're changing America. <laughs> They're stealing the very idea of America. What is that idea? I think it is egalitarianism. We have been pursued, in pursuit of, for 225 odd years. We've been trying to get toward some notion of egalitarianism. Nobody's better than anybody else. Anybody can make it. Everybody's got a chance. That idea of egalitarianism, we haven't achieved it, but at least... We've been trying to get there. And now they're saying, we no longer have to try. We no longer have to strive. Now what I find, and here's some good news, I turn to this segment of the program, that American people know this. They sense something has gone desperately wrong in our country. This is not the country we thought that we were building, that we've changed course somehow, gone down some rabbit path off of that truth. And people are deeply troubled. I saw a bumper sticker on an old pickup truck down in Austin where I live a couple of years ago. This bumper sticker said, where are we going? And what am I doing in this handbasket? <laughs> people know. But here's the best news of all. The best news of all. You, ordinary Americans, great activists like... VFP are not merely mad as hell, but raising hell, raising issues, and raising hope. The people of America are revolting, in the very best sense of that word. <laughs> I am a lucky duck, and then I get to travel a whole lot, and I've visited with some of y'all. I've been in your communities, and coming again, probably. I've been just about every place that's got a zip code, and Everywhere I've been, I find that there's some individual, some group of individuals, some coalition of groups of individuals who are fighting back against this political and economic exclusion that they're hanging around our necks, lighting little prairie fires of rebellion. Your own work. 120-something chapters, you just added six more, reaching out and gaining ground. People all across America not waiting on time delay to pass a minimum wage increase. They've already passed local ordinances 
for living wage increases. Seven fifty, nine fifty, eleven fifty an hour. You don't hear about it in the media, but eighty cities have already passed that. I find people taking on the beast of Bentonville, Arkansas, Walmart. Knocking down our wages. Spinning out our independent businesses, changing the environment of our cities. They say, oh, well, you can't beat Walmart. Walmart's too tough, too big, too mighty. Can't beat Walmart. Too much money, too politically connected. Well, then we need to look at this chart and this book that I wrote that has 180 communities in America that have already defeated Walmart. Again, you don't hear about it. The media doesn't talk about it, but it's there. It's happening. Up and down the road, there's a massive grassroots movement steadily building, thoroughly progressive and aggressive. People are ready for a new politics of fairness, justice, and opportunity. In this same book, I got a chapter called Even the Smallest Dog Can Lift His Leg on the Tallest Building. <laughs> and I did something in here. I, I went into the polling data. I'm talking about the classic polls, the USA, Time Magazine, et cetera, et cetera, polls, and, and went down beneath the surface question that gets reported and looked at the other data. And I found a very different America than we're told that exists. For example, on budget priorities. When Bush came into office, he said, we've got to have all these tax cuts for the rich because the people want their money back. That's what the people want. Well, actually, 67% of the people say they would prefer to have more spending on education and health care than to have tax cuts. Education and health care, 67%. Take health care. Even the Democrats in Congress say, oh, well, we, we can't possibly talk about single-payer universal health care for all the people because the American people are too conservative. That would scare them to death. So we're going to have some little prescription drug benefit for certain low-income seniors under Medicare, yada, yada, yada. Well, actually, 64% of the American people say it is the federal government's responsibility to make sure that every American has health care. 64%. Right on down the line. Public education. 84% uh, of the American people would pay more in taxes for public schools if the money went to raise teacher salary, reduce class size, and fix rundown schools. 84%. Well, I know some of you say, well, really, Hightower? I mean, are you truly dumber than a dust bunny? I mean, did you not notice? that unpleasantness of last November? <laughs> Did Bush not win? Is he not now strutting around with a Viagra-sized smirk on his face? <laughs> Claiming, I've got a mandate, I've got a mandate. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I came out of that election with mixed emotions. <clears throat> You know, mixed emotions, they say, is when you see your 16-year-old daughter come home from the prom with a Gideon Bible under her arm. <laughs> Let that soak in. So, so I do have mixed emotions. First of all, let's be clear, we did not lose. John Kerry lost. But he was always the least of it. I mean, let's be honest here among us chickens. Kerry could not have connected with a working stiff if we had him on a street corner handing out free Budweiser's and Slim Jims. It just wasn't going to happen. He lost, but we did not. We had all this enormous grassroots activity, including this organization taking part in that election. All sorts of new groups springing up. 55 million people voted for Kerry, despite him. 55 million people voted uh, for him. We had a 25% increase in young people voters. 
25% over the year 2000. They're not going away. None of us are going away. We did not lose. We gained skills and talent, votes, and future candidates. Second, Bush did not truly win, certainly not a mandate. In fact, he got 31% of an eligible vote in America. That's what he got, 31% of the eligible vote, 29 percent went to carry, 40 percent, the majority, the plurality, did not vote. Now, 31 percent is to a mandate what near beer is to beer. <laughs> and now, with the war, occupations, his assault on Social Security, Bush's numbers are in the ditch. They're beneath mad cow disease right now. I don't know if you've seen these numbers. It's really... Pretty astonishing. Let me offer you some. They'll be in this next issue. The low down the latest polls, only 38% of Americans approve of Bush's handling of Iraq. Less than half now think that invading Iraq was the right thing to do. An amazing 43% say we should bring the troops home now. 43%. of what the Bushites will do. They will do what they have always done. George W. is an absolute corporate wet dream. That's all he has ever been. That's all he will ever be. But the question is, what will we do? What are you and I going to do? A few, even among progressives, are defeatist. They want to drown their sorrows in a glass of wine. Oh, woe is me. We lost the presidential election. Bush is in the White House. We can't win. I'm going to Canada. <laughs> and some are worse. Some are saying that America has turned right wing and progressives must back off. Got to hide and wait. Be quiet, they say to us. Be quiet. Be quiet? <laughs> Holy Thomas Paine. <laughs> Since when do freedom-loving Americans ever cower in quietude? If you don't speak out when it matters, when would it ever matter that you would speak out? This is the time. We've got to speak out. Be louder than ever. Mark Twain said it well. Loyalty to the country always. Loyalty to the government when it deserves it. It's a very different thing. Be quiet? We can't be quiet. We have no right to be quiet. Too many democracy fighters before you and me fought, bled, died to make it possible for us to speak out, organize, protest, agitate, dissent. If we stay quiet, Bush and his plutocratic pals win. Democracy, fairness, and justice lose. As you know from VFP's work, the opposite of courage is not cowardice. The opposite of courage is conformity. Just go along. Even a dead fish can go with the flow, right? <laughs> well, again, I believe that this is a big time in America. I think we're in another of those when in the course of human events moments that Thomas Jefferson wrote about. A big, big time for you and me. They're stealing our country. They're stealing the idea of America itself. Sam Adams, the man, not the beer, <laughs> though he was a brewer, founder of the Sons of Liberty, the organizer of the Boston Tea Party. Sam Adams said, if ever a time should come when vain and aspiring men shall possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. Yeah. That's you and me. That's us. Our time has come. I say to you now, just recognize your power. Recognize the integrity that you have within you and within this organization and your ability to reach out and use that power to forge coalitions. The powers that be try to keep us apart. They say to farmers, oh, your enemies 
labor unions. They say to the unions, your enemies are the environmentalists. And they say to the environmentalists, your enemy are those poor people. Well, as Jesse Jackson put it, we might not all come over on the same boat, but we're in the same boat now. That's a powerful political reality. We've got to get together. We've got to reach out, not just to the bean sprout eaters, but to those snuff dippers out there as well. And I know some people say, well, getting progressives together, that's kind of like trying to herd cats. And yeah, that's difficult, but let me say to you, anybody who says you cannot herd a cat, herd, herd cats, has never heard of a can opener. <laughs> that little collection of values, economic fairness, social justice, equal opportunity for all people. We can unite people around it. And we've got to be tough. We've got to be blunt. We've got to go right at people with it. I know some people say, and the pundits in Washington, they're saying, oh, well, the discourse has become so coarse. Uh, it, it is so uncivil. We need a civil discourse. But here we are in Texas. I'll take you back to 1842 when Sam Houston was running against a man named David Burnett for the presidency of the Republic of Texas. And Sam Houston was in a debate with Burnett, and Burnett was quibbling about something or other, and Houston turned on him, and he said, you prate about the faults of other men while the blot of foul, unmitigated treason rests upon you, you political wrangler and canting hypocrite whom the waters of Jordan could never cleanse from your political and moral leprosy. Don't you wish John Kerry had said that to George Bush? And one final thing, we're building for the long haul. You don't win these historic progressive struggles in one year or in a few years. It takes the continual effort and the refurbishing of your movement as you're now, now doing by bringing in the younger Iraqi, Iraq war veterans and etc. My friend, uh, as my friend Willie Nelson said to me once, said, Hi, Tower, the early bird might get the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> We're in it for the long haul. We're in a big fight. And I finally say to you, trust the people. The people of this country want exactly what you want. We want our country back. We want it back. There's a moving, I'll leave you this thought. There's a moving company down in Austin, Texas, where I live. And it's uh, when I first moved there, this moving company had advertisements. And they, had, they actually had an ad in the Yellow Pages. And they said, if we can get it loose, we can move it. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. You get it loose at the grassroots level, and the people will move it for themselves. Thanks so much. Thanks to Ben.